It's a special this evening with with someone I know quite well, uh, recently won a BMI Icon Award, and I thought we would get him in to celebrate not only his incredible catalogue of songs, but also what I think was an amazing year for music, 1983. Please welcome Gary Kemp to the show. Gary, good to see you. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Congratulations on the award. Um, Does it ever get ever less than thrilling to be honoured by the wider industry? I don't think I would use the word thrilling. It's more nerve-wracking. It's more... It it fills me more with self doubt. It makes me uh, embrace my imposter syndrome even more. I I really struggled with that when I got the award the other night. Um, getting up on stage and talking, you know, it's a room full of mostly you know peers and people in the business. <clears throat> I I can never you know I'm 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 always thinking, but I'm just not I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. You've got the wrong guy. And uh, and I felt really nervous when I got up. I I gave a speech which was really about my beginnings in music really and how I discovered songwriting and a particular mentor that I had in my life and um and then I had to sing a song and of course I was completely dry mouthed by the time I had to sing the song um I'm actually much much more relaxed playing in front of 20,000 people than I am in play, playing in a 300 people in a in a you know and, and and saying thank you for the award. And now we're talking sort of the 80s and 1983. By 1983, Spandau Ballet were already very well established, two albums in. But am I right in saying that you are still living at home at this point with mum and dad? <clears throat> yeah, still living at home. You know, I'm a good working class boy. Working class boys only leave home when they get married. <laughs> um, and um, and I wasn't planning on getting married. And um, the, the end of the second album... Which we can discuss this obviously, and we will. Was a was it was a slightly difficult moment in my, it the end of the you know all, all second albums are difficult, and we we nearly crashed and burned, but we recovered, and <clears throat> and I then had to go and write the true album, and I wrote it mostly in my bedroom at home, um, and you know with my mum and dad, you know downstairs in the living room, and you know being disturbed by the calls of. Get, come on, your dinner's getting cold, etc. Writing songs and calling my brother in and playing him the songs and and sort of testing the water with him first. Um, you know, we 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 lived in a council house. Um, um, but before then, we lived in a in in a one floor of a of a council building, which didn't even have its own door. It just you could just walk past it and go up to the next level where some another family lived. All three families who lived in this block shared an outside loo. None of us had a bathroom. So we lived there until I was 15. And um, and I was playing most of my, making most of my early songwriting forays um, in a bedroom I shared with my brother. Um, but but now we were living in, you know, heightened, beautiful reality of, 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 of a... Sp- I had my own bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and these, uh, these songs... Came to you, take us back right, to yeah, that yeah, bedroom, okay. take us so back to... So you want to... 1983, you want 19... a true album, yeah. right? Well... Because <clears throat> where was Spandau Ballet before that? You say the, those first two yeah. records so, and the second album, a little difficult, So right? we had the electronica stuff that we started with, to cut long story short, and, and, and the freeze, and, and, and that first album, Journeys to Glory. And the second album was with Chant Number One, primarily, and Paint Me Down. So it had a funk element to it. We dabbled in other kinds of music on that record. But we released a song called She Love Like Diamond, which in a way was the songwriting bridge for me going forward into something more musical um, than I would do on True. But I didn't think we produced it very well. We didn't really know how to play it. it we redid the song actually years later, 2010 for an acoustic album and it, it, it came out fantastically. But right at that point, it didn't chart. I think it got to 43, which was disaster. Slap in the face, right? We had one more chance, we felt, on that album there was a song called Instinction and Richard James Burgess had produced the original version of that on that album there was something missing in it and ABC and and and, and Dollar had just kind of had been releasing records and this really amazing guy from Buggles was Trevor Horn was about you know and and we picked up the phone and we said Trevor could you would you like to to have another look at this song so we didn't just re- he didn't just remix it. We re-recorded a lot of stuff, came up with a lot of different ideas, um, used some of the original track that we did on that album. He reinvented it for us, 
an instinction went top 10. <laughs> Phew. Saved our butts. <laughs> but he put you in a difficult position. And the band may well have been different if he hadn't given... He gave you yeah. an ultimatum. Well, that and, was later on. That yeah. was later on. So that was when I'd written the True album. And actually, I hadn't written the song True at that point. I'd written um, a few songs. One was called Pleasure, which ended up on the True album. And at this point, the, the, the True album was called The Pleasure Project. And this would be probably late 82, early 82. Yeah, 80, 82. It would be 82. And, um, and so... Trevor said, well, I'd like to produce that song, Pleasure. We went in to Nomis, which was a rehearsal studio at the time, did some rehearsals for it. And then we, we all checked into Air Studios, which was on Oxford Street at that point. And we had two days putting down the drum tracks or attempting to put down the drum tracks. And yeah, Trevor then called our manager and said, look, I want to do this, but he'll have to get rid of the drummer. Which is classic Trevor, right? It's no comment on John Keeble, our drummer, because he was he is a great drummer. Yeah. It's just, you know, Trevor likes to, you know, em emboss himself quite heavily on an act. And I think he was going through some frustration. Maybe things weren't working out that day. And other bands may have done that. Mm. But we said, no, we can't do that. John's staying. And if you don't want to produce it, then um, we'll have to move on. And yet your relationship with Trevor is is still yeah. is still great. In yeah. fact, he's an upcoming guest on, on Rock on Tours Live, yeah, which we yeah, will talk yeah. about a little later. But when you, you create these songs, and they're very personal songs to you, and then you release them, and it's a bit like sending your kids off to, to college or to university. They're off, and they will now make life well, under their own steam. It's you, no longer yours, right? Yeah, but I mean, if, if you know, this is what, what we're in and I'm, I'm, I'm potentially use the word arts, we're in the arts for, because the arts are all about communication. They're all about, and the reason I listen to music and the reason I read books and look at art and watch plays is because I want to learn something. Because that's how you get, that's how you you, you, re, you think, wow, I'm, I'm the same as that. That, what you're singing about, that's how I feel. You know, this character on this stage, that's, that's, I get that. I'm learning from this and I'm not the only one in the world. And so, this is a human instinct. Um, and so when we make music and write music, it's not about my bank account. Instinctively, at first, it's about communication, communicating with people and, and giving them something of your experience and hoping that they relate to that. It's, there's a, it's, um, it's a wonderful um, two-way street. Um, so, so I no, I mean, if no one, when I write a song, I want as many people in around to hear it you know it's all about that communication the big thing of course in those days in the 80s was get was plugging your record you know because people weren't going to watch it on youtube they weren't going to be able to find it on, on a computer they didn't exist the only place they could hear that song was on the radio so getting your song into the radio and you know by legal means of course was was paramount one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, about was was the fashion, which when I look back at the, the video footage of, of that era, 80s fashion was, was just iconic. And I think we live now in an era where everything seems a little bit contrived. How much, in reality, how much thought went into what you were wearing, the look of Spandau Ballet and your contemporaries at the time? Well, yeah, I think it, it went in a lot, but it, it was something that we it went into my entire teenage years. You know, they were all about, how did I look in this? You know, we're going to a club. Come on, what does this look like? Let's make this. You know, I had my. I remember drawing on the floor out of pieces of paper that I'd stuck together a pair of trousers, and my mum, who was a seamstress, copying it, with, in, putting the material down over it, cutting it around it, making these trousers. Uh, I forgot to ask for a set of fly, <laughs> pair, a fly in it though. No, I remember going to the club and having to pull it down. But um, th th you know, we were obsessed with. With, with looks and with clothes and with because that's what you'd that was your identity carrying it down the street nowadays you have a profile page on instagram or whatever um so you can promote yourself on that in those days the only place to promote yourself was on the street and tribes were really hugely um visible you know oh the, they're the punks we better turn around the corner or they're the teds or they're the, the mods or the rockabillies you know and we were these other kids that were just sort of seemed to be a bit one step ahead and eventually got called new romantics but very bowie influenced obviously so really important and all the way up through into 1983 you know those suits that we had made for for true they were designed by a kid that we knew in a club called chris sullivan and they were meant to look like 
cowboy sort of gamblers. Um, that was the general idea. Um, but also, I guess they were slightly a, a, a parody of 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 um, the celeb of, of performance of um, you know of the of, of Vegas, if you like. Um, it was they were it was it was always important. Yeah, we was we were slightly obsessed. I remember once we did a gig in Portugal. This is in slightly earlier in 1981. We flown from Lisbon down to Porto. And it was very hot and, you know, we were all wearing our sort of shorts and flip-flops type thing, you know, um, put our gear on the plane. Got a gig that night, <clears throat> we get to Porto, there's no bags at the airport. And we definitely can't go on stage in shorts and flip-flops because Porto had this new romantic club and we were greeted at the airport by all these, you know, absolute fanboys. And um, so we go, we go to the hotel and my, my brother's thinking what to do. And we noticed we all had white sheets. So we took all the sheets off the bed. We made these kind of white togas and ripped up some sheets and made them head to headbands because that was kind of the thing in 82 <laughs> and 81, 82. And went on stage dressed in all these white sheets. We went then back. We then went back two months later to do a TV in Lisbon and there were people wearing it. Everyone's them. wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> How much time did you have to sort of look around to see what? your contemporaries were doing because all, always that, really always. so whether it was rod stewart or the police or your rhythmics or you know whoever. No, always because that's you know it's if you're a football manager you know if you if you're the manager of man city what are you doing you're looking at what how tottenham play you're looking to see how arsenal play because when you come up against them you want to beat them so there was lots of that going on and you know this this is you know you you've got to listen to what, what's con, what's new. You know, I'd hear a synth sound somewhere and think, hmm, that's really good. You know, maybe we could get something like that from the next record. You know, I think, um, you know, we could be hypercritical, of course, as we, <laughs> in a sort of rather bitchy way. But I think we were generally, um, every one of us was embracing all of the um, adventures in music that, that, that different bands were making. What was the track from that era that you wish you'd written? Oh, that be one hundred percent. I know what it is because it came out the same year as True, and 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 it's the reason why True didn't win any awards anywhere, even though it was nominated. And it was Every Breath You Take by by the Police. What is it? About I that? just I just actually when I did the BMI when I picked up the BMI award. Oh, by the way, I should explain that BMI is not Body Mass Index. <laughs> I didn't get it because I'm ripped. Although so, you're looking anyway, great, yeah. <laughs> it's it's Broadcasting Music Incorporation, and it's it's um it's American. And it um, collates publishing money for songwriters. So every breath you take. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, while I was there, every breath you take picked up an award for the most played song on American radio. Nineteen million airplays on American radio. Now that that number sort of seems small compared to the billion streams of of songs. But you've got to remember, this is being played on a radio. Mm. Someone is putting it on, and they put it on nineteen million times. Um, I think I've played it about 18 million times in this, in this, <laughs> in this country, but it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's one of those songs, and there's quite a few of that era that just don't age to me. I can hear it a hundred times a week, and it, it, there's something I hear well, new in a track like yeah. Every Breath You Take or, uh, or, or True. Or no, I, lo you know, I love those songs. Some songs just, and you don't know what makes you write that song, and if Sting could write that song again, he would. Of course he would you know he's written other great songs but there's something about that song there's something about the lyrics in that song and the way he the, the menace in that song particularly you know that he that he that, i mean it's, not, it's a stalking song it's rather weird people play it at weddings apparently and it's just not that it's not apt um but, but yeah i think some songs have a longevity in them you know <clears throat> that um so you have to be you know the sound of it hasn't aged the, the the direction of it, the way it lifts and moves through the particular chord sequences and the and the bridge into the chorus into the middle eight, has something that always gives you goosebumps. Um, actually, talking of goosebumps, I heard a great. I I went to see uh, last week. I went to see the opening of um, of um, Sunset Boulevard and Nico Scherzinger was utterly amazing in it. And I saw Don Black afterwards, who who wrote the lyrics for it. He's, lovely fantastic historic songwriter 83 now i think and i said that was great wasn't it don unbelievable he said 
I run out of goosebumps. And I said, that's a great expression. <laughs> He's an incredible songwriter. If you're unaware of the work of Don Black, go Google him and just go and look at the incredible catalogue of songs he's written so what kind of inspires you now because you had out during lockdown i think or just after yeah. uh, your solo album in solo yeah. you're working on a new album at the moment and technology's changed which means you can do it at home or your studio yeah. in north london uh, what, what sort of inspires you now to create songs well i i'd say it's the the anxiety of age is definitely something that's on my mind um, you write songs because they're, you know, when you go and do therapy, people say, you know, keep a journal, but songs are my journal now. Um, <clears throat> when you talk to a therapist, <laughs> as I do, I have to say, I have to admit, you never say that thing that surprises you until about 45 minutes in, right? And then you just say something, you're like, wow, that's, that's it. And because you've dug into your subconsciousness. So when you sit down and write a song, you you begin from the sort of front of your mind, from the conscious mind. That's not the stuff you'll keep. The stuff but you've got to persevere and you'll eventually find through your subconsciousness that you'll 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 come up with something that takes you by surprise, but is the essence of what you're trying to say and is you. I think, you know, a lot of stuff now being you know i'm 64 now you know a lot of stuff now is about a certain anxiety in one's life a certain you know there's there's memories to deal with there are there's mortality to deal with there's you know failing physicality in a way you know these things i'm not a young man writing but I, but I, I can, it would be stupid for me to write a song about, yeah, I've been chasing this girl around town and, you know, you know, it's, that's not me. So, but there are plenty of people out there who, who, who would, who would probably enjoy the communication mm. of me talking about those things. And that the In Solo album dealt a fair amount with that. Um, that's not to say that it's maudlin. <laughs> it's, but I think actually, as you're talking, uh, it's resonating with me. I'm 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 younger. I'm 46, but I feel anxious ridden from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed. And that's, I think living in a city is yeah. Difficult. I got you know kids with their own issues and complexities, and you know look outside, read a read a newspaper. It's terrifying. I think what right? I'm trying to say is honesty is one of, is where I'm coming from now. When I wrote for apart from True, which was a purely honest song, and those about, songs fell out of you. It as was well. the difficulty of writing. A love song for someone that might know who they are and um why do i find it hard to write the next line when i want the truth to be said but mostly in those days you were writing songs that were anthemic that were aspirational that were about you on a impossible but bigger landscape um and and they were for tony so there were a lot of things that that were not truthful to me but were right for the band and now I think that you know that that's it's it's much more important to write from the from the heart, um, yeah. But you also get to flex a few other muscles as well. So you're in Nick Mason's yeah. Saucer Full of Secrets, which yeah. if people don't know is the the early years of Pink Floyd playing the sort of the Sid era stuff, right? It is, and and to be honest, I have to say doing solo records, I'm, I'm making my third right now, is what what I'm enjoying is being a guitar player. Because that's something that I almost had to hide in Spandau Ballet because there were no rooms for guitar solos and guitar parts. It was mostly, you know, the sax was out there and, and Tony's voice. So so I, and I think Nick was a real way of me showing people and being able to express myself through the guitar as another voice because, you know, I feel like I kept it a bit hidden. Well, well <laughs> the reviews, the early reviews for your live shows, and, you know, you'll know the, the quote that I'm about to, to give now, which was Gary Kemp. Who knew, Who knew? Yeah. that he could play guitar quite like that? And you're playing mm -hmm. early Pink Floyd stuff, which is very complicated yeah. stuff to play music. This has right? been a brilliant part of my life uh, the last five years working with Nick Mason. Um, you know, I grew up on Pink Floyd as well. 1973 as opposed to 83, the Dark Side of the Moon obviously changed everyone's ideas about music and, um, and gave us a whole new landscape to play in. Still exists, still works, still works to this day. Um, and and then going back and listening, and I first heard the Sid uh, Barrett's Pink Floyd through David Bowie, because because David Bowie did see Emily play on the Pinups album, which is fifty years old uh, this week, I think. Yeah. Um, see Emily play was 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 
the first time I'd ever heard it was was incredible record. I thought, what a great song. And then I got to dig back and hear the original Pink Floyd version. If it hadn't been for Sid Barrett, there would be no David Bowie looking like Ziggy Stardust because because Sid was a massive influence on 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 David. David was a massive influence on Johnny Rotten. I mean, you can join the dots between Sid and me and my music and what I like, because after Johnny Rotten came punk and came new romantic. And of course, there is a connection. So I didn't feel like I was very far away from Sid and that and that part of the Pink Floyd oeuvre. And the other thing that you're doing is, uh, well, you're a broadcaster as well with your uh, with your podcast series, yes, which you so brilliantly produce. Well, it's a it's a whole heap of fun, isn't it? Really, we we sort of started this idea just before lockdown, I think. Rock really. on tours. Rock on tours. Yeah, and uh, here here we are, nearly four years later, with what is it, 160 odd episodes. This has been so much fun because we get to speak. Me, first of all, Guy and I, we we gas. Right, we guess. Yeah, you would be doing the podcast even if we weren't yeah. recording it and putting it out yeah. there because you were on the bus. Well, right? we started off on the bus with with Nick back in whenever it was 2018, I think, and um, uh, we had an old Grey Whistle Test DVD which we kept watching, and every time we watched it, we just talked all the way through it about 70s, um, you know, stuff, you know, and facts and rumours and about the artists, and um, you know, someone's. In the old days, someone would have said, "You two get a room." Now they say, "You two get a podcast." Right? So we got a podcast and um, and called it Rock on Tours, where we talk to another musician every week, and we've had some brilliant ones on. I mean, Alice Cooper, Mick Fleetwood, beautiful David Crosby, um, Noel Gallagher, Johnny Marr. I mean, it's just, it just goes on and on, you know. Um, Coverdale, Coverdale, of course, is is our god. Uh, we um, yeah, it's been an extraordinary chance for me to chat with musicians that I've admired sometimes all my for, for the whole of my life you know Hank Marvin people like that you know so um it's it I would I absolutely love doing that and quite often you know we, we get things out of these people that no one else has because they're chatting with another, with two other musicians and a lot of our stuff ends up a lot of our stuff from the podcast ends up in the in the newspaper the next day uh, of all the things I have done in my ridiculous in inverted commas career um producing rock on tours is is one of my very favorite things i'm super proud of mm. the stories that we have extracted and shared with people and spending you know an hour with you this evening is is always is always fun thank you for coming in good to see you thank you ben <laughs>